right now, I'd like to bring you a different kind of story. In its own way, it's just as dramatic as anything a writer could dream of. It has to do with a new power source. This power source is the atom. Over 70 years ago, the deadly power of the atomic bomb was reborn as the peaceful atom. It was modern. We were at the forefront of technology. Glamorous. They were like inside a secret, inside this magical world, and irresistible to governments. It was clear for France that his solution was the nuclear. And business. Everybody in the electric utility business is suddenly deciding, wow, we need uh, nuclear power too. But from the beginning, the peaceful atom has been dogged by concerns about safety. Freeman Allen basically made clear that accidents could happen. In fact, serious accidents. By rising costs. It's economically so complex, so difficult, so tricky, it's kind of pulled under by its own dead weight. And by ordinary people determined to stop it. That period of time left us with a scorecard of about 4-0 in favor of Greenpeace, to be quite honest with you. And today, nuclear power is in a battle for survival. Es gibt keine uh, nukleare Renaissance. Das ist ein Märchen aus der Propaganda -Abteil. Loved, hated, and impossible to ignore, the atom changed our world. This is its story. Five, four, three, two, one. In the aftermath of World War II, everyone was talking about the awesome and terrifying capabilities of atomic power. What really changed the climate was a speech given by President Eisenhower in December 1953 at the United Nations, which he called Atoms for Peace. Atomic bombs today are more than 25 times as powerful as the weapon with which the atomic age dawned. It began with a lot of gloom and doom, and then he circles around and ends with this beautiful, happy tale of how atomic energy is going to bring blessings and health and prosperity to the world. This greatest of destructive forces can be developed into a great boom for the benefit of all mankind. The president's speech was immediately transmitted to 74 overseas posts by the USIA press service before the communists could distort and misinterpret America's proposals. Adams for Peace quickly became internationalized. At American embassies all over the world, the USIA campaign got underway. The propaganda around Atoms for Peace included traveling exhibits where people could go and see little nuclear artifacts. Uh, and these exhibits would attract throngs of people around the world. The exhibit in West Berlin was visited by a quarter of a million people, including thousands from the Soviet zone. In India, Prime Minister Nehru came to view the exhibit and shared the experience with thousands of his countrymen. Of all the countries that were targeted for Adams for Peace propaganda, none was more important to the American government than Japan. On the first day of November 1955, the United States Adams for Peace exhibition opened in Hibiya Park, Tokyo. The United States sent exhibits to Japan. It promoted the work of Japanese scientists in atomic energy uh, work. Atoms for Peace helped sort of send this message that, hey, we're the good guys. It sort of helped whitewash the bad odor created by Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The general public was being encouraged to look on the bright side, so to speak, by demonstrating that there was this enthusiasm burgeoning all over the world. Was it propaganda or was it policy? The answer is it was both. It was, at the same time, an effort to influence public perceptions, to change the way people talked about nuclear energy. I voted against atomic energy because I thought it was the work of the devil. Now I know I was wrong. And on the other hand, it was a serious, genuine initiative to spread what they saw as the benefits of atomic power throughout the world. The voice of America was beginning to give the world translations of the president's words in 43 languages. 
the potential of civil nuclear power suddenly was seen as a global beacon of progress. Every country involved wanted to take part in the development of this, this new gleaming future of atomic energy. Kernkraft war eine der Technologien, mit denen man sich unterschieden hat, ob man hochtechnologisches Land ist oder ob man eben mehr zum Durchschnitt gehört. If you were a young scientist or engineer graduating college in the 1950s in the United States of America, you were in a pretty sweet place. Possibly you could make an analogy to the dot-com boom in the 90s, but it's bigger than that. It's huge. The scientists had stepped forward as the new wizards, the warlocks, the magicians, who were going to bring all these wonderful things to the future. They were like inside this magical world. You know, the, the scientists that, that studied this were really fascinating people, and they were part of this very, very elite group of special people. The British set up the first civil nuclear plant at Calder Hall in the UK. Appropriately for such a very important event, the Queen came to perform the ceremony of the big switch-on. A definite lead in the second industrial revolution has been taken by Britain. The British government was triumphant at being the first nation to launch a nuclear power program. Britain saw itself as the pioneer of nuclear power. We were the first with a nuclear power station, and our technology led the world. But others weren't far behind them. La France entrera dans la production d'électricité d'origine nucléaire et se placera au rang des grandes nations atomiques avec les États-Unis, l'URSS et l'Angleterre. Donc quand De Gaulle était, est arrivé au pouvoir après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, sa préoccupation était de rétablir la gloire de la France, la position de la France euh, en tant que puissance. Et donc dès octobre 1945, le général De Gaulle, par ordonnance, a créé le commissariat à l'énergie atomique. Even if some slight deception was involved in explaining what these shiny new reactors were actually for. The first nuclear power site in France was presented as a prototype for electricity generation, and that was what all the fanfare was about. Voici dévoilé au public les aspects de cette réalisation qui fait entrer la France dans le cycle de l'utilisation industrielle de l'atome. In reality, and from the very beginning, the Marco reactors were designed to optimize the production of weapons-grade plutonium. Cold Hall wasn't a power reactor. Its purpose was to produce weapons-grade plutonium material. The electricity was a useful byproduct, and in fact, that, that dial was not connected to the reactor at all. The governments weren't the only ones spinning a positive atomic message private nuclear companies were getting in on the act too. General Electric was really instrumental in this. They did a lot of work. They had a comic book, they had film strips, and it was all done with bright colors, with exciting little characters. Let's start by meeting a leading authority on the subject, Dr. Atom. The public's mood was galvanized by the new atomic power stations springing up around them. The reactors actually became tourist attractions in and of themselves. At Marcoul, there was a lookout point where tourists could go and view models of the reactor and see the whole site. Growing up in Essex and going for days out on the River Blackwater, I remember very well driving there along small country roads. But as I got close to Bradwell, the roads suddenly became very large and very impressive and you could look along towards the mouth of the river and see this very clean, very efficient nuclear power station. It looked very modern, it looked the future. But no one felt the thrill quite so much as those on the inside. I felt proud to work at Bradwell. When I look back, I think, yeah, I was there, I did that. We felt we were at the forefront of technology it wasn't only Bradwell, but the country as a whole was raising their head up and saying, we can make it. 50 years has gone by since then, even had a lot of hair. And uh, one of my jobs was to test materials for faults, defects, and uh, used to climb inside the reactor building uh, main structure 
inside the ducts and everything and test all of the welds. Looking rather like a super version of a plastic Macintosh is a new suit designed for workers at Britain's atomic plants. Once you're inside and the zip's been fastened, all that remains is to pump in compressed air so that the wearer can breathe easily. He used to be dressed up like a, a Michelin man with a special clothing with an umbilical cord supplying air to my um, uh, body sort of thing and uh, for breathing and also throat microphones and then climb through every part of the reactor and the boilers, etc. We were looked up to because people from coal plants used to come to us and say, my, isn't it clean? Yes. Isn't it wonderful, this clean environment you live in? I could take you to an old coal-fired power station. We're doing exactly what Tony and I used to do. You'd come out black. Across the pond, America's engineering giants were so enamoured with nuclear power, they were ready to bet their wallets on it. What they did was to offer a fixed price or turnkey contract. All the utility had to do was to go to the reactor when it was built and turn the key and turn on the reactor. It seemed like there was no risk in building a nuclear power plant because the price was low and the vendors, Westinghouse and General Electric, guaranteed that price. And then comes the gold rush, where everybody in the electric utility business is suddenly deciding, wow, we need uh, nuclear power too. But not everyone was so enthusiastic. I went down to Bodega, Bodega by the sea. There was a plan to build a reactor at Viadega Bay, California. Protests first started from local people who were just concerned about the view. But then people began to do a certain amount of homework, and they began to get concerned by radioactivity released from the plant in normal operation. The local fishermen were worried, would we be able to f sell our fish? Would people be worried about the radioactivity of it? There was also, more particularly, the possibility of an accident involving a nuclear plant, which might release a lot more radioactivity. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The most interesting stunt was they released a whole lot of balloons and when they came down they would have little messages on it saying this could be radioactivity from the reactors. The public didn't in fact really know that there had already been a number of significant industrial accidents in nuclear installations in Canada, in Switzerland, in the US and in the UK. There was a very big fire at Windscale. I was never told. I discovered when I went to Japan I was talking to the Japanese minister, and he said to me, how, did, um, uh, how are you getting on with dealing with the consequences of the fire? And I said to my officials, what fire? Oh, we didn't want to bother you, minister. But Iga Bay actually persuaded the local electricity company to abandon the plant. And this was the first time that a nuclear proposal of this kind had actually failed because of opposition by the public and it was going to be the first of many. I remember when I first went to the States as a minister, uh, I was told that they had a policy of 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 nuclear power stations by the year 2000, but the local opposition was so strong that they couldn't build them. There were individual activists who were fighting individual plants around the country, and then Ralph Nader called a conference, the so-called Critical Mass Conference, uh, that brought together 1,400 of these actives and kind of gave them a way to see, wow, we're not alone. It was frustrating to deal with uh, what I sometimes thought of as organized ignorance, and it was frustrating to deal with professionals like Ralph Nader who kept stimulating this sort of thing. The credible accident of one nuclear power plant uh, catastrophe would be 45,000 dead, well over 100,000 seriously injured, $17 billion worth of property damage, and an area the size of Pennsylvania contaminated. Now, there were some uh, nuclear scientists and engineers who helped this opposition. We had two marvelous General Electric engineers who quit and became uh, whistleblowers. I testified on the NRC's quality assurance program that the quality assurance on a toaster is greater than that for the instruments that control a nuclear power plant. 
On the other hand, there was inadvertent uh, support. The very pro-nuclear director of the Oak Ridge National Lab, Alvin Weinberg, uh, always harbored concerns. He thought that there shouldn't be one nuclear plant here and one nuclear plant there, that it would be better if we had six in one nuclear reservation so that you could use what he called the small number of very competent uh, scientists and engineers to manage it. He knew what the risks were. But at one time, he said to me, you know what you're asking all of us nuclear scientists and engineers to do, Ralph? And I said, what? He said, to give up a lifetime of knowledge and their career, and that's very hard to do. But just as the opposition was growing in confidence, global events suddenly made nuclear power look a whole lot more appealing. In 1973, the big Middle East producers cut off oil shipments to major consuming countries. When the embargo was lifted, the price of foreign oil had jumped from three to $12 a barrel, four times higher than before. This nation in 1980 can have all the energy we need. Now, don't write an editorial on this. You're really going to catch it from your readers if you do, because it scares people. Nuclear power. They think of the bomb. They think of the possibility that one of them's going to blow up. My house in San Clemente is just 12 miles from the Southern California Edison Company's nuclear power plant. It's safe. It produces good power. It's clean power. And the United States, which first found the secret of the atom, is behind where it ought to be in the development of nuclear power. Nixon proposed a huge expansion of nuclear power in the name of getting America out from under the boot of OPEC. But even Nixon's support couldn't disguise one rather pressing problem. It became clear very quickly that the turnkey orders were horribly underpriced. The cost of every reactor and the nuclear power plant surrounding it those costs were doubling every two years. Doubled and then it doubled again. As the cost of building reactors went up and up and up, they just couldn't afford it. It, be it became untenable. The Americans may have been wondering if they could afford to expand their nuclear power program, but across the Atlantic, the French couldn't afford not to. When there was the multiplication by four du the price of petrol, the shock was quite considerable because we, c'était 68% de notre électricité qui était du pétrole. Il y avait très très peu de pays qui étaient à ce point-là. En France, on a toutes sortes de choses. Pourtant, une chose nous manque, une chose essentielle, le pétrole. Le pétrole, nous sommes obligés de l'acheter à d'autres, cher, trop cher. D'un seul coup, on s'est rendu compte que on avait été accro au pétrole sans s'en rendre compte, mais que maintenant, ça devenait insupportable. Oui, alors effectivement, quand arrive la crise pétrolière, Il était clair pour la France que son salut, c'était le, le nucléaire. Pourquoi l'énergie nucléaire Parce que l'électricité. Le seul endroit où on pouvait facilement remplacer le pétrole, eh c'était l'électricité, justement. Parce que, en 1973, on avait déjà une première génération de réacteurs nucléaires. Spurred on by the oil crisis, the French government moved quickly to ramp up the number of nuclear power plants in the country. Samedi matin, le délégué à l'énergie me téléphone en me disant combien de centrales, combien de, cent, de, de, enfin, de tranches en fait, quel est le nombre de tranches que vous pouvez faire au maximum euh, euh, en rythme manuel. 3, 4, 5, 6, on a fait une campagne tout à l'heure pour savoir ce qu'on en pensait. Et finalement, on a confirmé que c'était 6 à 7. And they didn't have to worry about what the public thought. Écoutez, de, du point de vue des décisions, c'est un petit groupe de gens, et bon, des DF, du CEA essentiellement, de la haute administration. Et c'est l'État qui, qui représente le peuple. Enfin, c'est très fort. En France, quand on avait reçu l'autorisation de faire une centrale, c'était fini, on n'y touchait plus. In America, things were more complicated. Les États-Unis, c'était très morcelé. Il y avait à peu près 2800 compagnies d'électricité différentes. Sur 108 réacteurs, vous aviez trois identiques. Et 101, tous différents les uns des autres. 
They kept changing the designs in a, in a competitive frenzy to try and get ahead of the other guy. And that meant that the construction times for uh, nuclear plants just ballooned. Over the next two decades, the French would successfully embark on the most ambitious nuclear program anywhere in the world. The Americans could only look on and wonder. Pendant que les Français construisaient 58 réacteurs, les Américains en ont annulé 200. Et voilà la différence. Meanwhile, France's next door neighbors had their own problems to contend with. In the 1970s, uh, West Germany saw the growth of, of one of the largest movements against nuclear energy in uh, Western Europe, possibly the world. Ja, Besorgnis war, dass, dass man äh, schon gehört hatte, dass das äh, im, im Umkreis von deutschen Anlagen äh, unerklärliche äh, Krankheitsfälle oder Veränderungen der Umwelt gibt. Ja, man muss sehen, Deutschland hat eine Vergangenheit, auch eine Kriegsvergangenheit und es war Teil des Kalten Krieges, wo gerade auch Nuklearwaffen eine wichtige Bedeutung hatten. Und haben wir hier große Unsicherheitsfaktoren und die wurden durch die Atomenergie verstärkt. The real point of origin, the protests in a very small uh, South German village of Wiel, where a new power station was supposed to be built. Und ähm, die lokalen äh, Bürgerinitiativen versucht, diesen Standort zu verhindern. Zum Schluss blieb ihnen eigentlich nur noch übrig, jetzt besetzen wir den Bauplatz. Werden die Gegenstände beschlagnahmt? They mobbed the site. They brought in tens of thousands of people, too many really for the police to handle, and set up a camp with a lot of guitar singing and public classes and free love and all that sort of a thing. Hier reden Winzer aus dem Kaiserstuhl mit ähm, Studenten, äh, mit äh, Journalisten, mit äh, Experten. Das ist so ein Ort, an dem auch diese enorme Gegenexpertise, die die deutsche anti atomkraftbewegung aufbaut, äh, sozusagen zu sich findet. But Veal's peaceful teachings soon gave way to far uglier scenes. Wherever there were plans to build a reactor, there were huge protests, um, and they often led to clashes with the police. In Brockdorf, uh, 1981, waren 150.000 Leute bei einer verbotenen Demonstration <laughs> im Februar bei Eiseskälte. Ja. Darauf hat der Staat völlig unverhältnismäßig reagiert. Er hat Tränengas geworfen. Sie haben äh, Hundertschaften aus Mannschaftshubschraubern abgesetzt, die dann knüppelnd da durchgingen. Kalka wir komplett gefilzt worden und dann trotzdem nicht an den Bauplatz gelassen worden. Es wurde einfach verboten zu demonstrieren. Protesters on both sides of the Atlantic had been sounding the alarm about the prospect of an accident at a nuclear plant. Fears the industry always dismissed. Until one morning in March 1979. I came in to work and a commissioner went running by me, John Ahern, and he said, can I use your car? I said, sure. I get upstairs, I, I discover that, you know, we've got a problem. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, an accident at a nuclear power plant. A spokesman said that a feed water pump broke down this morning, automatically shutting down the three-mile nuclear power plant. People think that in an emergency, everybody starts running around like in an operating room, you know. In fact, everything kind of got slowed down because you, Tremendous uncertainty about the facts. I got a radiation monitor and I walked all around the entire plant reading the radiation levels. And I found that the management in charge of the plant and the operators who were operating it were simply ill-prepared either to operate the plant or to talk to the public about it. The information was contradictory meters who were reading very high high radiation experts were saying these meters must be wrong 
The overwhelming feeling is just the fog of information, you know, information fog. I remember Walter Cronkite closing off his news program that evening, showing an aerial view of a cooling tower, saying, I'm scared. There's absolutely no radiation about it at all, but that's what they were showing. I was on, on the set of Saturday Night Live, and uh, Gilda Ratner, who's a very famous comedian, was very frightened, and she asked uh, her uh, colleagues uh, whether they were all going to die. But it scared the wits out of people in the eastern coast of the United States. It was very much unexpected, and uh, there was, was a feeling that this, was, this was much worse than anything that one could have imagined. There had been some near serious accidents, but not one like Three Mile Island. And when that happened, I think the whole, the whole framework fell apart. It could no longer claim that nuclear plants were safe. That was a very defining moment. They're gonna build them even though we say no. They are the rulers, they say which way to go. We are the people. They are nuclear madness. Three Mile Island was only the start of something bigger. They're gonna blow us apart. I think that period of time left us with a scorecard of about 4-0 in favour of Greenpeace, to be quite honest with you. Greenpeace were activists, true activists, and that was a new problem to deal with. In the 80s, we had this sort of um, this, this inevitable march towards a, a nuclear future, and at the same time, we were looking at a situation where there was this wheezing, puffing plant at Windscale, and which was pumping out two million gallons of contaminated material into the Irish Sea every day. I mean, the whole thing was just a joke. I mean, it really was. And we had to address it in some way. At first light, Greenpeace were already up and about. Their plan was simple, to block the one and a half mile long discharge pipe with stoppers like this one. I held a confidential briefing with the press and I said, you know, we're going to bung the pipe up. We have bungs ready. We are going to stop the discharges. And somehow that got leaked. And BNFL then knew that we were going to do it. Right at this moment, um, British nuclear fuels have beaten us to the punch. They've obviously um, known precisely what we've been going to do for the last week or so. They've worked very heavily on this uh, pipe and uh, it's impossible for us with the material we've got at the moment to block the pipe. It was a, a balancing act always to try to deal with them sensibly, but in the end, to use the law if necessary to stop them doing things which I felt were dangerous. And they needed to be told they were not be, be, beyond the law any more than we were. And so I was a baddie at times. Public confidence was at an all-time low, uh, and yet the industry did not give up. They created an organization called the Committee on Energy Awareness that was out there saying, we need to stop our dependence on foreign oil and nuclear power can do this. They deeply, and I think genuinely, believed in the nuclear enterprise. How could anybody turn against this technology? This is a miracle technology. Why don't you love us anymore? Advocates of nuclear power and opponents of nuclear power just didn't speak the same language. It wasn't that one of them had a monopoly of facts, it's that they interpreted the evidence differently. They saw the range of concerns differently. The 1980s were a period of, of difficulty, uh, but there was at least an element of the nuclear industry that was trying to deal with the public relations, the explanation the reassurance. BNFL had decided that they would no longer use the name Windscale for the facility. They would call it Sellafield, which is the name of the little village where it had originally been built. Ironically, soon after the name change was announced, BNFL was accused of having radioactivity on the shoreline and leaks in at least two of their facilities. I was tempted to go and tackle the safety issue. And then I was told, no, be positive about the good things which nuclear will bring. And that was the start. 
of the idea of a Vista Center. Because the facts at the Sellafield Exhibition Center are there for all to see. Welcome to Sellafield, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Wilson, and today I'll be showing you around the Sellafield plant on a guided bus tour. The tour will include a visit to Calder Hall Power Station to see the generation of electricity there on the world's first commercial sized nuclear power station. Subliminal messages got through which we could then build on. It must be safe, mustn't it? Because they've invited us to go up, go around. And they are trying to be open and honest because they're asking us to go there. Nuclear had previously been really in, in, in secrecy. The industry had acquired a reputation for just not telling anybody anything. And as a result, uh, no one really trusted them. So they went for a kind of, uh, kind of glasnost, openness policy. And they, they tried to break down the, the suspicion uh, that, that had uh, accompanied nuclear over the previous decades. To learn more about what we do and how we do it, come to our new visitor centre at Sellafield, BNFL, where science never sleeps. And then, just as the charm offensive finally seemed to be working... Unless viewers of Moscow Television were watching the 9pm news closely on Monday, April 28, they would have missed the brief and buried report of the biggest nuclear accident in history. An accident that had occurred at least two days earlier at Chernobyl in the Ukraine. Chernobyl definitively ended the industry's line that there could never be an explosion, that a reactor could never blow up like a bomb. Effectively, that's what happened. It blew up. We're talking here about uninhabitability. After Chernobyl, there were 12,500 square kilometers all around it in Ukraine and Belarus, uninhabitable, nothing but, you know, animals and birds. Uh, abandoned villages, abandoned towns, doors swinging open in the wind. It was a dramatic event and, of course, did create widespread doubts about nuclear power. There was a very concerted effort by all the Western governments to distance themselves as fast as they could and blame it all on Russian technology. It can be stated categorically that an accident similar to that one could not happen in a British nuclear power station. The reactor of the Chernobyl design simply wouldn't have been allowed to operate in Britain. It was a very serious incident, and I did question whether I wanted to stay in the industry. I came to the conclusion that I did. Well, Chernobyl hasn't changed my opinion at all. Um, I was quite happy before Chernobyl, as I am now. Our safety standards are very high, and uh, We've got uh, many backup systems, and uh, I feel there's no problem at all. In the days following the disaster, a plume of radioactive fallout drifted west over Europe, much to the alarm of those in its path. After the accident of Chernobyl, in Germany and Italy, it was almost hysteria, collective. Kein Sinnes Organ des Menschen kann die Gefahr bemerken. Nur solche Geräte zeigen sie an. Radioaktivität. I was there on the, on the school uh, playground with my geography teacher at the time who had got himself a Geiger counter out of the pharmacy to check whether there was any high radioactivity level. Of course, it was useless because we didn't know what the normal level was. In the moment where es Verhaltensmaßregeln gab, is kein Wild, is keine Pilze. In dem moment war die Akzeptanz in der deutschen Bevölkerung völlig dahin. Das Leben ist ganz normal und zieht einfach so vor sich hin. Und dann passiert Tschernobyl und das schlägt ein wie eine Bombe bei uns, ganz persönlich. Für mich ist es ein Damaskus-Erlebnis, weil mir ist das wie die Schuppen vor den Augen gefallen, was das überhaupt bedeutet. Wir nannten uns zunächst Eltern gegen Atomkraft, aber dann haben wir gesagt, nee, das ist eigentlich kein guter Name. Wir wollen ja nicht gegen was sein, wir wollen für etwas sein. Und deswegen haben wir uns dann umgenannt in Eltern für atomfreie Zukunft, damit ganz klar ist, wofür. Wir haben äh, viel musische Geschichten gemacht, wir haben auch Volksmusik gemacht, wir haben das, die äh, Rockmusik für die Jugend. These ordinary German families 
were so committed to ridding their village of nuclear power that they made an audacious bid to take control of the local energy grid. Weil sie können sich sicher vorstellen, ähm, wenn eine Bürgerinitiative sagt, wir bauen ein eigenes Energieversorgungsunternehmen auf, äh, um die Bürger unserer Stadt mit Strom zu versorgen, dann sagt jeder erstmal, ja, wie soll denn das gehen? Und natürlich war gerade der Energieversorger hat gesagt, ja, das geht ja überhaupt nicht, das schaffen die doch nie. But against all the odds, these energy rebels did succeed creating a new citizen-owned energy cooperative. Wir haben ja eine Vision. Die Vision ist eine Energieversorgung ohne Atom und der Energieversorger war nicht bereit dazu. Back in Britain, they had other things to worry about. All over the country, ordinary electricity users will be preparing for the 12 regional electricity companies share offers. As nuclear power threatened to sink one of Margaret Thatcher's flagship policies. The postponement by six months of the privatisation of the electricity industry is only six months. I mean, it's still going to happen. Is it really that significant? I think it's significant because what it indicates is that the plans are a complete mess. And most people already realise that their bills have gone up in order to pave the way for privatisation. They've got huge problems because they want to sell the nuclear industry, which is going to be very difficult to sell. The cost of ultimately decommissioning the stations, where you return the site to uh, essentially a completely sort of usable, clean status, uh, had been underestimated. The costs of future dealing with the spent fuel had been underestimated. I think it's very unwise to embark on a new nuclear program when we don't even know how to deal with the, what's left over the legacy of the old one. We realised that the nuclear industry just could not be privatised quite early on, and we told the government, we can't do it. And the government said, rubbish, go away and think of a way that we can do it. So we went away and we're trying this and we're trying that. But in the end, we just said, look, we just really can't do it. And so the government in the end said, OK, you can't do it, therefore we will pull it. And it was quite a momentous occasion. A few years later, the government did finally manage to sell off its nuclear power stations. But it wasn't long before the new private nuclear company also ran into trouble. So the company uh, went into steady financial decline from, from about the year 2000. And by 2002, it was in effect bankrupt. It had to be rescued by the government with uh, £340 million initially, uh, and eventually it went up to over £600 million to keep the company alive. The message was a pretty clear one for all potential future nuclear investors. This is a very risky business. Nuclear suddenly looked like a, just, just a dead-end area to work in, and these often very, very well-qualified, very smart people um, felt that they'd, you know, they'd made a terrible career choice and their, their whole life had, you know, in a sense, been wasted. I remember the 1990s getting to a point where I thought, well, maybe the nuclear dream has died. There really was a global decline. In the past, where there have been planning hundreds, 300 or so new stations, in the 1990s it was down to, you know, below 20. In the United States, nuclear was not growing. They were not selling new reactors. The whole industry stayed uh, essentially in a, in a, a near-death condition. The atom had never looked so vulnerable and nowhere more so than in Germany. Die Friedensbewegung, die Ökologiebewegung eigentlich danach gesucht, dass sie eine neue Tribüne haben wollten. Und sie entdeckten die Parlamente als Tribüne. When the Green Party formed a government with the center-left Social Democrats in 1998, time was up for nuclear power. Ja, im Jahr 2000 hat die rot-grüne Regierung damals beschlossen, aus der Atomenergie auszusteigen. Dann haben wir uns eingelassen auf einen Prozess mit den Unternehmen darüber zu verhandeln, dass sie die Laufzeiten, die bis dahin unbegrenzt waren, dass wir diese so begrenzen, dass es zu einem schrittweisen Abschalten kommt. Was im Umkehrschluss eben hieß, wenn die existierende Reaktion der Reaktoren in den 70er, 80er Jahren in Betrieb gegangen wird, wenn die sozusagen ans Ende ihrer Laufzeit kommen, dann würde sozusagen der Atomausstieg in Deutschland ganz von selbst kommen. Zum Schluss zumindest dieser Ausstiegsbeschluss von allen Parteien mitgetragen wurde, auch von den industriellen Partnern. 
Und äh, das hat auch auf breite Akzeptanz gestoßen. Auch in den Medien, die Bevölkerung hat dies unterstützt. The Atom was yesterday's news. It desperately needed to recapture the excitement of those early years. But how? The very first time I heard the term global warming was from a nuclear power industry executive in 1981. I mean, I said, what is that? And he explained what global warming was. And he says, that's why we can't rely on coal. He says, just once I'd like to pick up the phone and say, Atomic Industrial Forum, coal kills. Energy is a story that is still being written. Let's continue writing it with less CO2. By the 2000s, people had begun to realize that global warming was a severe problem. And people, even, environ even leading environmentalists, began to say, well, maybe we'd better rethink nuclear power. The threat of climate change prompted us to, to ask the question, if we wanted to build nuclear plants in the United States by the year 2010, what would it take? So we started to ask that question to the Department of Energy. But also there were policymakers. Uh, Senator Pete Domenici was a, a leading voice in the Congress on this. I think we all know that the world must have nuclear power as soon as possible. We funded um, and co-funded with industry various activities to try to break through some of the barriers that made nuclear a non-viable option for the industry. Um, and that, I think, was the beginning of the turnaround. It is time for this country to start building nuclear power plants again. We are announcing roughly $8 billion in loan guarantees to break ground on the first new nuclear plant in our country in three decades. The first new nuclear power plant in nearly three decades. The U.S. nuclear industry brimmed over with renewed confidence as 13 companies applied to build 25 new reactors. And the mood was changing in the U.K. too. By 2025, if current policy is unchanged, there will be a dramatic gap on our targets to reduce CO2 emissions. These facts put the replacement of nuclear power stations back on the agenda with a vengeance. I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that the, the politicians say one thing in opposition and another thing in government, but that's what happens, and that's certainly what happened to Blair. It was often reported that Tony Blair wanted to leave a strong legacy, and that part of his legacy was perhaps uh, launching a nuclear power program that would solve the problem of global warming. Um, Insulating a few lofts, bringing in a few small wind turbines on land doesn't have that same impressive sound to it as launching a huge nuclear power program. Blair's successors were equally enthusiastic. In 2008, Gordon Brown called for eight new nuclear plants to be built across the UK. And in 2010, David Cameron's new coalition government greenlit these plans. Even the Germans looked like they might be willing to give the atom another chance. The nuclear industry knew that Merkel was rethinking her previous position and then when um, the CDU and the Liberal Party, the FDP, formed a government, um, they actually agreed to go back on the decision and not to phase out nuclear energy. The grund idee was zu dem Zeitpunkt, lass uns doch die Kernkraftwerke so lang technisch machbar, länger, wirk länger nutzen und die daraus zusätzlichen Erträge besteuern und diese Steuer dazu zu verwenden, um Energieveränderungen in der energiepolitischen Landschaft in Deutschland zu finanzieren. And the French were now hoping to repeat their nuclear success on the international stage. When Sarkozy came to power, many of the trips he made abroad involved seeking uh, nuclear deals. He signed contracts with China, he signed nuclear cooperation agreements with several countries in North Africa and the Middle East. You need to keep in mind that you can't build endless numbers of reactors in France, no matter how enthusiastic you get about it. In terms of centrales, we have already 80% of our electricity, almost 75-80% that comes from nuclear. So, in order to keep Areva and EDF in business, 
they have to export. The extraordinary thing that happened looking back was that the, the, the British energy, the British nuclear industry, became effectively the French nuclear industry and was taken over by EDF, the, the, the French government state-owned energy company. But the British market, they say, is now their most important one because our energy needs are the biggest and the most urgent. So confident are they, they're committing for 60 years. As the first decade of the new century came to a close, the nuclear renaissance was in full swing. And then... You know, I still remember the morning when I woke up and heard there was an earthquake and tsunami in Japan, and I immediately started thinking about friends I have in Japan, so I went to the office and you know, was you know, trying to reach people by, by email, but also watching events on TV. And then we started to know, notice that there was a problem at one of the nuclear power plants. In the early years, the worst radioactivity in the, in the planet came from all the weapons testing. Now it's coming from the accidents on the civilian side. I remember uh, there was one senior staff person uh, who was watching the video on television, and he was almost in tears. And I remember he turned to me and he said, you know, I spent my whole career trying to keep something like this from happening, and, and now I'm watching it happen on television. And it was really a very emotional moment. This was a Western design reactor, and this was also Japan. You know, this is a country, a highly advanced uh, country with excellent engineers, and somehow this still happened. The most important lesson, I think, from Fukushima is that even if you do your very best, in preparing for a natural disaster that could uh, challenge a nuclear power plant, you might get it wrong. We do not believe that there is a chance that there would be a significant chance of harmful radiation coming to Southern California. The country's chief cabinet secretary sought to calm fears. He said, even if a second explosion were to happen, the reactor itself may not be affected. When Fukushima happened, you could see that the nuclear industry's damage limitation machine had moved into action. As fate would have it, I was actually myself traveling with my wife through Japan. And for me personally, I remember hearing these reassurances from the Japanese government. And I couldn't help but thinking of the sort of irony of this message that the country that, for, that had been such a target of this peaceful atom message in the 1950s was now itself putting out its own version of reassurance of uh, atomic energy uh, PR. There were some extraordinary uh, memos and emails going around at the time, so that one senior official in the, in the business department, whose name to this day I still don't know, but he's obviously old school, because he, uh, he said we must do what we can to you know, uh, stop the anti-nuclear anti chaps and chapesses getting their messages across. Faced with their biggest PR headache since Chernobyl, governments united with the industry to show their support for nuclear, with one very obvious exception. Nach Fukushima geht es um etwas anderes. Es geht um die Verlässlichkeit von Risikoannahmen und um die Verlässlichkeit von Wahrscheinlichkeitsanalysen. Damit wird bis 2022 die Nutzung der Kernenergie in Deutschland beendet. Ich glaube, der Atomausstieg war für Merkel persönlich schon ein großer Schritt. Äh, Frau Merkel ist ja bekanntlich äh, Physikerin und war in den 90er Jahren tatsächlich ein Befürworter der Atomkraft, einschließlich Überlegungen für neue Atomkraftwerke. Die, die politische Elite in Deutschland war von diesem Fukushima wirklich durchgeschüttelt. Fukushima allein hätte nicht ausgereicht. Dass sie in Deutschland diesen dramatischen Umkehr ausgelöst haben, dieses hatte damit zu tun, dass eben in Deutschland es erstens nach wie vor einen breiten Konsens in der Bevölkerung dagegen gab und zweitens eine aktive Bewegung, die fast wie in den späten 70er Jahren zu Zehntausenden hier durch Berlin gezogen ist. Das noch, man musste wirklich das, glaube ich, so als den letzten äh, Schritt in einem langen, Abschied von der Atomkraft äh, sehen, der eben seit den 70er Jahren sich äh, hingezogen äh, hat. 
keine Partei, egal welcher Couleur, äh, findet man heute, die überhaupt nur noch äh, Atomenergie im Ansatz besprechen wollen würden. Also das Thema ist komplett durch. In Germany today, nuclear power is officially over. Elsewhere, it's not dead, but it's not exactly thriving either. We don't have a British nuclear fuels anymore, and I find that sad. Um, some of us old directors get together once a year for dinner and one's due next month. And we sit around the dinner table all that stuff and weep into our wine or beer about what's happened to our company. At this point, solar and wind power are growing so fast and the costs are declining so rapidly that nuclear is like this old dinosaur. It can't possibly keep up. Some breaking news to share with you this morning. The owner of the Kiwani nuclear power plant says it'll shut the plant down next year. The only nuclear power plant in Massachusetts will be shutting down by 2019. Citing California's changing energy landscape, Pacific Gas and Electric is closing Diablo Canyon. The real factor in the United States is just practicalities. I mean, we had the discovery of natural gas in large quantities, and it's much cheaper and it's much easier. Frankreich hat nicht das Geld heute, seine 58 Kernkraftwerke neu zu ersetzen. Es gibt keine äh, nukleare Renaissance. Das ist ein Märchen aus der Propagandaabteilung. Of course, nuclear power still has its champions. One of the things we want to do at DOE <laughs> is, to, is to make nuclear energy cool again. You know, what are the problems that the people who object to nuclear power really have? And can we solve those technically? Can we make nuclear power that doesn't produce waste that lasts for hundreds of thousands of years? Can we make nuclear power plants that can't melt down? Uh, and I think the answer to those questions is actually yes. And dozens of new nuclear startups are betting on experimental next generation reactors to save the flagging industry, though it's not yet clear if they'll succeed. Whether it will happen or not, I think we can't say just now because for the latest generation of reactors, really there isn't enough experience and enough um, knowledge of whether you can bring these costs down. I used to say that the best reactor was a paper reactor. It was a reactor that only existed on paper because once you actually start to pour concrete and weld steel, it turns out to be a lot more difficult than you thought. And that has been historically the case with every successive design of reactor that has been tried. I don't think you can be confident that it is going to happen this time in the Western world. I think you'll be confident it's going to happen in uh, the Far East. Some of the oldest players in the nuclear game are now turning to China. Make no mistake about it, this is an important day for Britain. Willing to pay whatever it takes to keep the nuclear dream alive. The focus has been on a plant called Hinkley Point C, and the claim was made by EDF that this would be done absolutely without any public subsidy which turned out, of course, to be complete nonsense. EDF, si je peux dire, a bien négocié avec le gouvernement à l'époque Cameron. Ils ont négocié en disant, euh, vous ne payez rien, c'est les partenaires français et chinois qui, font, qui payent tout, mais en revanche, vous nous garantissez qu'on pourra rentrer dans nos frais. The subsidies got less and less well disguised until they got to the point where they were offering a guaranteed price for the electricity for 35 years at three times the going rate in the UK. Just after the Brexit, Theresa May had said that she put in cause the deal that had been passed between the government of Cameron and EDF. And then the Chinese were intervened. It seems that this intervention Chinese has brought the euh, government of Theresa May to reconsider Et la, la est bien partie maintenant. China is today the only major country successfully building reactors at home and selling their expertise abroad. But only time will tell whether the Chinese nuclear barons can escape the political pressures that have bedeviled their Western counterparts for so many decades. It's an inherently political technology because of the nature of the, the risk and the safety aspects. It's economically so complex, so difficult, so tricky. It's kind of 
pulled under by its own dead weight. But unless there's a major breakthrough to a fundamentally more economic form of nuclear power, nuclear is always going to be struggling to survive. Nuclear power always enjoyed powerful backing from scientists, engineers and politicians who felt that they were best equipped to decide its future. It felt like if the public would just leave them alone, they would control the technology, they would fix the problems with the accidents. You know, if they just let us keep working, we're going to take care of all your concerns and all your problems. But when it comes to the relationship between the atom and us, history suggests that, in the end, it will surely be us who decides. People who are selling computers think of all kinds of reasons you know, the people ought to buy computers. <laughs> so these guys are thinking of all kinds of reasons for us to buy nuclear power plants, because um, that's, that's what they're selling. It's we who have to decide if we want to buy them. <laughs> <laughs>